Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. It's been a long time since we had him. I, I don't know if I recognize him. The former governor of Colorado, Bill Owens. Oh, yeah, it's well, good to be back. back. And we used to do this all the time we when, did. When, you, when you were governor. We did. I did it about a year or two. I've, I've done yeah, it a couple, a couple of times, times since but, I left, you know, left office. One of, one of the things that I always appreciated back, back when you were governor was how accessible you were. I mean, even when you and I had policy disagreements, mm -hmm. you'd come on the show or on the radio show, and we'd duke it out and then go off and have a beer. And, and um, that, that hasn't happened since you've been gone. Uh, so uh, I miss that. You don't get governors in here very often? No, you no. Know, and actually, Matter we, fact, we Ritter, didn't, Ritter we, went all, all four years, and we asked him every single week, and he uh, wouldn't come down. You know, we didn't disagree that much. We did at no, the I end agree. on the one issue. And so for the eight years, I mean, obviously, my privatization, my concealed carry, our tax cuts, um, it was, uh, it was... Oh, uh, the good old days. Well, they, they were nice. It's like I'm, I'm always being asked, how do you like it now? And I really like it because I still get the title governor, but I don't have to do anything to earn it. But you get the parking space. You know, I don't get the parking space, though. I have to tell you that under both Governor Ritter and Hickenlooper, if I need a space at the Capitol, <laughs> well, I know, I know who really? to call. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, my guess is you don't call them. You probably call the... Uh, we uh, probably call the, the good state with their who's, permission. Right. And, uh, now, tell, tell me honestly, though. You've, you've You've got to miss it. I mean, you, you've made a, a lifetime of public service. Mm -hmm. You, from a state rep to a state senator mm -hmm. to a treasurer. I mean, that that's a long career uh, uh, doing it. And then to go cold turkey afterwards. Come on, don't don't haven't, tell me you don't haven't miss it. missed it for a minute. Really, and that's really the truth. You know, it's interesting. At least it's interesting to me. Um, I wondered whether I'd miss it in my last year as governor. I'd been governor for seven years yeah. at that point, and as I left the Capitol that day. I thought, you know, this is going to be interesting to see. I didn't miss it a minute. Next day I was on a plane to New York on a business deal, really active in the private sector. I, I travel a lot. Um, it's nice earning a little bit more than you do as governor. So people come up to me and say, Bill, how you doing? I say, I'm doing fine. They say, oh, really? How are you doing? <laughs> no, really, say, talk to me. I'm really doing fine. <laughs> uh, if I had wanted to stay in public service, I could have run for the U.S. Senate three times. Um, both when I was governor as well as two times since, total of three, and, 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 and would have been you, competitive you can, for any you of them. You considered that. I mean, it was definitely that, that first time around, I thought consider, it was on your mind. didn't it consider what I was trying to do, and this was when um, Senator Campbell kind of abruptly announced he wasn't running again in right. late spring. All I did was go through a 10-day consideration to give us time to try to find a candidate because while I was considering, a number of other candidates didn't get in the race. Um, Ken Salazar didn't get in the race until I had announced I wasn't. So frankly, I was buying time to try to give the party a chance to make up because Ben's abrupt you know, hospital right. bed I'm leaving didn't leave us much time to try to coordinate. Now that you've got candidate. almost six years since being governor, you got a little perspective. Tell me, what what part of that those eight years, or, or even the entire career, what, what are you most proud of? If there was one the one thing you, you'd single out and go, you know, I, I did that one right. You know, it's it's hard to 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 arrive at one, but in almost a stream of consciousness, um, vetoed hundreds of millions of dollars of spending more than all of Colorado's governors in history. Um, line item veto, budget vetoes. Vetoed more bills than all of Colorado's governors in history. Hundreds and hundreds of bills. And, but more importantly, we, we, um, we did some important things in terms of tax cuts, um, concealed carry. We did things in terms of privatization, privatized a third of our prisons. Any particular moments? I mean, you look back, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you <coughs> just a couple, but when you left, and, and Bill Ritter, who, who I personally enjoy quite a bit, he's a right. fascinating man and a, and a good guy, um, but he did not have the administrative chops, it, I think it took, and I think most people agreed, to run the shop. At the end of the day, not only do you sign bills, but you're, you're running... You're a CEO you're, of a you're, large you're, enterprise. You're, you're running a, a business. You're running an operation, I should say. Right. And it's a weird, complex, bizarre operation, and it needs, it needs to be run. And you, you run that really well. And I think when, when uh, Ritter came in, he, as a DA, he didn't have the experience you did coming through to, to do that. And I, I'm not the only one to have noticed that. I think a lot of people in government did. One thing I was really proud of was how you handled Columbine. I mean, one of the, one of the saddest days in, in state history. And uh, you, know, you don't plan for that sort of stuff. But I, um, uh, I, I think you were there. You were on the spot. Uh, uh, you were there for the families. And, and uh, I, I, 
I think that was a shining moment for you. Well, thank it, you. It, 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 is, it is a very sad way. Oh, you know exactly. I mean. and, I, and I understand. And, and you know what I realized was, and I had some good advice from a from a well-known Colorado journalist who who told me, "Look, you're the you're the father of Colorado now." And uh, Dick Lamb provided some really good advice yeah. to me. I was a brand new governor. I'd been governor for less than a hundred days. All of a sudden, you have the eyes of the, the nation and the world on you. But we also were in the middle of a very contentious gun debate right then in our legislature. And the challenge was making sure that we learned some lessons, that we tried to heal the state, that none of us had to step back from our principles. And uh, we, we moved forward. And, and with a lot of help from some great people, we, we did as best you can in that horrible situation. When you I look think, back, do you have any 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 regrets? Which, you know, if, if, you yeah. could have, if you could have done one thing differently, what, what would that have You know, have my been? regret was I signed a school voucher bill, and my regret was it got uh, overturned, as you know. Yeah. Um, we had a great voucher bill. We did a lot of choice in education. We expanded charter schools. And we, I signed a charter, a voucher bill, and it was it was overturned by the Supreme Court. I wouldn't have said this at the time, but six years later, on on specious reasons, um, its reasoning was was um, political. Anything you would have done differently? Any, and, any decision? Yeah, I would have done more. We, you know, it's such an all-encompassing job. But now that you are out of it, you think, why didn't I try to address that? At the time when you're in the battle and you have so much happening, it's hard to really concentrate and think, what am I missing? But there were additional things I wish I had done. Listening to Jeb Bush speak um, in, and uh, here in Colorado last week, I, I was part of that effort. And Jeb did, Governor Bush did some great things I wish I'd thought of. As he walked through Florida, I'm thinking, wow, I wish I, if I were governor now, I would try to do that. Amazing. And I we did what, a lot on CSAP and on grading schools and... and but also but, helping charter schools with more funding. That was a, a big plus that, that helped. Let me, let me bring into some other states as well. I mean, talking about what Jeb Bush did, uh, we, we both watched, you must have been watching with great interest what happened in, in Wisconsin. I mean, for me, that was a, uh, a real watershed moment when it came to being able to stand up to the power of, of government unions. And, and nobody gave uh, Walker a whole lot of uh, chance to win this one. It looked That's like he, he was gone. He won handily. First of all, wa watching that from your point of view as a guy who's been in that hot seat, and you've done some things very similar to what, what Walker has done, what, w watching that, what was that like? Well, it was just I was proud of what Governor Walker did, and I was proud of what Wisconsin's electorate did. You shouldn't let public sector unions run the state. And from the time that um, their senators walked out of the legislature, and remember that was just two years ago that, that instead of allowing the majority to rule, 10 or 12 senators left the state. Um, big labor has tried to bludgeon Wisconsin, and the voters of Wisconsin stood up and said, no, we run the state, you don't. And so it was a reaffirmation of that fact, and if you can win in Wisconsin, you can win almost anywhere. I saw some great election results from San Jose and San Diego on pension reform and you know in order to balance this budget someday we're going to have to frankly take on some of those special entitlements that the good people who work for us in government over the years have accumulated we have to bring it down to parity and make it fair for those of us in the private sector watching that type of pressure though i mean th 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 those type of personal attacks towards the end of the walker recall it wasn't all about policy. It was he had a love child, and you know. Right. I mean, well, by you the way, saw when, some when, of the you're... same thing with RTD, <laughs> right. not the love right. child. But I mean, when you were on the RTD board, you had garbage thrown on your front porch. Yeah. You had had relatives who were insulted as you were insulted. I've had a little bit of that. Well, you've, and I you've guess, had more than a little bit and, of and that. And I you... guess what I what I really wish, and I, I saw Mr. Mayor Barrett as well as Governor Walker on that last night say the right things. I mean. There, we don't need to do this in our political system. It doesn't need to get that vicious on either side. Friends of mine who say, isn't it horrible what they say about President Obama? I say, yes, it is, but I've seen the same for President Bush, and I wish that the same people who are concerned about the level of hatred today about President Obama had also expressed that concern with my friend, President George Bush. Going back to, to Wisconsin, uh, 
the type of policies that were at the core of this, the thing that really got the unions up, up and mad, was something that you actually pioneered at the very beginning of, of your your governorship, and we, we didn't have we didn't have that level of reform, although we certainly right. worked at it at Independence Institute. But but you were able to do, through executive order as much as you possibly could on, on the issue of, of paycheck deductions. Talk to me about that. You have a good memory. I, well, it, and you've done a lot of work on it Well, since. it is. I mean, that, that was a leading part. I remember people calling me from around the country at Independence Institute to find out exactly what you did and how you did it so that they could replicate it in other states. Well, thanks for, thanks for the memories, as it were. Um, I've always felt it's unfair for government to collect dues for big labor. I think that labor unions certainly have a right to exist. There have been times when they were beneficial. There probably still are times when they could be beneficial. But the state of Colorado for years had collected union dues on behalf of the unions. So an employee signs up to work for the state, and the state says, would you like us to collect your dues for you and send them off to um, the FLCIO or the Colorado Association of Public Employees? And so when I became governor, this was not written in a statute that we did it. It was just kind of a policy. I stopped it. My first executive order said the state of Colorado will not collect union dues anymore. Let them go out the good old-fashioned way and get the check and get the deduction through the bank, but not with us. And it, 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 this was a, a, a consequence. It cut union membership by 50, 60 percent. Well, when you say and, that, you, and that, really that what tells it was, me, as you yeah. know, maybe maybe the unions weren't that much a part of those workers' lives. There, there's, there's something about when, you know, whether you're giving money to the NRA or the ACLU or your health club, it comes out of your, your checking account and you see it every right. month and you go, wait a second, I haven't been to the health club in, in three years, maybe I'm not going to do that. When government employees have that same opportunity to see the money coming out of their paycheck, uh, or out of, they actually have to write the check themselves instead of how automatically exactly. having it pulled out, you see it. It's kind of like withholdings. We only look it at is. what's left and therefore we don't get a sense of it. But th the reaction of how many people said, what? Half. I'm paying that much? Half. You know, and, and here's, as you know, here's how it works. The new employee joins state government. The, the shop superintendent comes by and says, good to have you here, and why don't you join the union? We're all in the union. And the young employee is a little intimidated on day one of work and says, sure, I'll join. Joins the union, and then $400 a year every year comes out. And it, 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 what I wanted to do is make that union work better with its employees by having to show its employees, not its employees, its members, um, how valuable it was. But it wasn't. And, it wasn't. And they, they voted with their feet. Half of them said, oh, when I have to write out a check, they're not worth it that much. And that was the key element that caused the recall in Wisconsin. It, was. it wasn't that the union members, the teachers unions, finally had to put in even a tiny bit amount to match what uh, the state was giving for health care or their retirement. They were paying nothing, nothing in health care. Right. People in the private sector, we pay quite a bit for right. our health care. That wasn't the problem. The problem was they didn't want the government to stop being that collection agent to pull that, that money out for fear that that government employees go, what, I'm, I'm spending $700 a year for, for, for this? It, it, that really was the reason for the recall. Here in Colorado, labor hated it. They argued. They sued me. They, they heckled at a few public meetings. I said to the, to, in public, I said, okay, let me just ask Colorado. Do you really think Colorado taxpayers should be paying to collect union dues? Colorado didn't think so, and that's why I, I was able to... But uh, your successor did. As that was it, your first executive order, Governor Bill Ritter, very first thing he did was to undo that. It was. Governor Ritter uh, reversed it with his executive order, which said the state of Colorado will collect union dues for you. So we're back to uh, four or five years later. I mean, for the eight years I was governor, we didn't. For the five, six years since I've been governor, we have been. And uh, it's a shame. I mean, I, as you one know, of, one I don't of those things that elections have consequences. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. If you, you know, and it's one of the reasons why my party, I believe, and, and uh, it needs to to understand that if you're with somebody 80 percent of the time, that's probably good enough compared to the reverse. Talking and about elections, um, you were a early supporter of George W. Bush. Right. Uh, he was a friend of yours. I think you met him back in Texas met when, when I was 20 years old. Really? And actually worked for him in his father's U.S. Senate campaign. Uh, Close friend. Since I've known you, 
you've introduced me to uh, uh, Governor Romney uh, mm -hmm. a couple of times. You've had him right. out several times right. yourself. When he lost for the nomination four years ago, uh, you, you keep bringing him out. What what is it that attracts you to to uh, to, to Romney? What what uh, because I mean you you locked on to this guy early on. Well, and it's it's really just because I think he's electable. Um, I share the view with William F. Buckley, and he is the gentleman who popularized this saying that that uh, I will I will support, and I'm paraphrasing Bill Buckley, the most conservative candidate who can win. And so Mitt Romney, and and that's a good example of 80 percent. By most standards, he, you know, he's 70, 80 percent conservative. He, I'm, I agree with him on virtually every major issue, and he's also electable. And so I want somebody who is not just perfect, but also someone who has a chance to defeat President Obama. What makes Romney electable? Well, I think he is. I think his Massachusetts record, his record as with the Olympics, his record in business, I think his persona, I think his intellect, he's going to be very good in these debates. And you know, what, what I've noticed in this process of politics is, is that by the time we finish a primary, almost every candidate is kind of demeaned and belittled. John McCain wasn't really on top of things when he finally won the primary four years ago. By the time we get through this process, even really good candidates like John McCain, Mitt Romney, President Bush are sometimes belittled or lessened, and it's, it's a challenge. I think Mitt Romney would be an excellent president. I think he will be a very good candidate. And having said that, each of the other candidates for president in our party had had also deficiencies. Rick Santorum wasn't really free trade sometimes. He was protectionist. Um, Newt Gingrich had numerous issues where some of us you might never, You differ. never knew where you, Newt was on an well, issue depending don't. on the day. And, and so if you ask for perfection, we're going to get it rarely. If you ask for pretty darn good, well, we had it in, in a John McCain, a George Bush, and a Mitt one Romney. Of the things, one of my big disappointments with, with Romney was, and you can imagine what right. it is, is, is his health care reform. Yes, you know, and he, mine too. I mean, know, that's where I disagree with him. When, when you were governor, you talked about things like opening up for cross-border uh, border purchases mm -hmm. so I could buy an insurance policy from Kansas right. if, if it was better. You, you talked HSAs. HSAs. We, you also talked about trying to do a uh, uh, more budget insurance plan, saying we've got, what, 56 mandates or something like that in and Colorado we actually, insurance? We did cut them so right. that you can have a Chevrolet plan instead of a Cadillac. Right. Romney did the opposite, exactly. and you know uh, it's hard for me to say Romney Care is all that different than Obamacare. Although uh, what Romney did was perfectly legal because right. he has a right, and what Obama did is unconstitutional. I think right. we'll find that out. I, I wish that um, Mitt Romney would come out and say, you know what, I'm the best guy to deal with Obamacare because. I made that mistake, mm -hmm. and I wish I didn't. So I've learned from that. Right. He hasn't done that. He's he's stuck by it, and I, I fear he's going to stick by it until, until election day. Uh, what does he need to do here in Colorado to win Colorado? Right now, he's a couple percentage points down in Colorado. I think we all agree Colorado is a must-win. It is for for both of them or either of them. What does he have to do here? You know, he has to continue to get the base to come home, and it is, and then he needs to attract the independents. And the only way to win Isn't that Colorado, an economy, though? Well, well, it, 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 if the if the base doesn't allow the independents to join, then it is it is a dichotomy. But in in my case, for example, I'm a very conservative person, most conservative governor. I think Colorado's recent history, or probably history. But, um, by, by but the way, you, that's that's not a high standard. I, I want to make that clear. Yeah. I, when I, I said I'll, recent, <laughs> I realized you know it, it's a little known <laughs> fact that of the last. Ten governors' races in Colorado. My party's only won two of them, and it's not it was, easy. It was, well, you know, it was love, wasn't it? It was actually me. No, um, but but it was you, the and then 10. before that, it was John Love. love but right. the last ten, we've had three um, Dick Lamb victories, three Roy oh, Romer right. victories, then Governor Ritter and Governor Hickenlooper. Oh, right. So that's eight. Wow. And then in, in so anyway, it's and, and to win in this state, you have to um, win the conservative base, and then you have to reach out for the independent. You don't do that by, by lessening your principles. You do it by emphasizing additional issues 
that might bring that that middle to you. Here's the, here's the and, worry and that I have, and that in order to get to the the Republican base, you might need to uh, spout out on social issues that Rick Santorum did very. I mean, that was his right. track, uh, and that's why he won the state in the in the caucus. Right. But in order to get to unaffiliated voters, particularly women, the same message is right. a complete turnoff on this side. Right. And so I, I, I'm 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 thinking that Romney, in order to get to do this has to say two different messages to two different groups and I don't know how he's going to do it. Well, he is conservative on social issues, but if you if we require him to talk about that all the way through October in order to get our base, then we lose. If the base understands, yes, he is a conservative, and I didn't talk about gun control right. um, during all of my races, yet I signed concealed carry, had an A rating from the NRA, was very conservative pro-liberty on guns, but you don't talk about it necessarily in the final two weeks of a campaign. What I talked about was reforming education. That's something that reaches across our African-American community, our Hispanic communities, and into the suburbs, and it's very effective. So we have to give, I think, um, Mitt Romney the flexibility not to change his principles or views, but what his message is going to be in October. You've always been a keen observer of political history. That's always been fun when we Enjoy get together. You, you, uh, going back to Reagan and uh, Lincoln, but also you look at other countries. What is it about President Obama that is galvanizing so many people on both sides of, of the equation? I, I don't think we've seen anything like this in the whole uh, American experiment. And I think, and tell me if, if you disagree, but I think we're on the precipice of, of going into policies that are completely unsustainable. Oh, absolutely. That, that we're, we're at a point where if we don't change course, we will be the next Greece. Absolutely. Uh, maybe not the next Greece, but we'll be on track to, right. to, to do it. And there'll be nobody there to offer us any, any help. I, I feel that this is the most important election of, of our lifetime, but why? why? What is it about Obama that, put it, put it into a context for me. You know, it's a good question, and I think it's, I think it's his reelect. I think right now what you're seeing is, is he really can't campaign on his own record. Um, how, do you, how do you campaign on, on the last four years? So what he will have to do and what he's going to do is, is attack, attack, divide, and hope at the last moment the division of the pie gives you 51% of the electorate. That's a challenge. There won't be any unification in this election. What I'm also hoping is, is that whoever wins is a patriot enough that they will realize this country is heading to the abyss. And in How the do you next mean four that? years. When people hear that, I mean, I, I think I understand what you're saying, but for somebody who doesn't know, what, what abyss? What are we talking about? The abyss is, is that we cannot sustain the deficits and the, the challenges of you know, the unfunded mandates of Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, we really are heading off a financial abyss. And it, it may be a year away, it may be two, it could be three, depending upon lower interest rates. Right. But if interest rates ever come up where those trillions of dollars of debt have to be funded at 4% instead of less than 1%, we're already there. My hope is whoever we elect next time says, look, regardless of of whether I'm a liberal or a conservative, we've got to fix this problem. Just as Nixon went to China for the best of reasons to confront the Soviets in their backyard, um, a President Obama reelected as a liberal, I'm hoping if he is reelected, I'm hoping he's not, but if he is, I'm hoping he does the right thing because only he will be able to do that for the next four years. A Romney, I'm sure he would uh, do it. When you say do it, what, what is the answer? I mean, I think both sides who can do math can say this is unsustainable. Right. And so you have one side, uh, my side, that we have got to take on the entitlement state. And that's my side. And the idea that now almost half of Americans don't pay income tax right. and over half are getting benefits from, from the government, right. that's when democracy turns into it mob does. rule and, and at what point it, it falls apart. But there's others who say, well, you know what? We need the other part to pay their fair share. If only, if only we raise more revenues, we can cover these, these entitlements. And these entitlements are so necessary. They're not coverable. And as you know, raising revenue often just brings you less revenue. And so I think what we need to do, instead of having a GDP, government percentage of GDP at 24, 25 percent, we need to reduce it back to where it was sustainable at the 18 and 19 percent level. Now, a stronger economy will bring that down some, but what we need to do is do as San Diego 
and San Jose just did on election night. We need to start to make different decisions on these future benefits that we promised. And we can do it. it, it it's relatively it's painful. You're, at, at this you know, point, I would have, argue that have, it isn't. But we have middle class entitlements now. We, right. we, have, we have people who are in the middle class now getting more money from government than less. Your home interest deduction. Yeah. Right. How, you know, how, are we gonna, how are we going to do that? Well, I, I think what you do is, you, and, and I'm not going to go through it all right now, but it is on Social Security, relatively minor changes would bring that into to balance. Change it by a year here, change it by a percentage point here, and in two, three, five, seven years, you start to see that curve dramatically shift. Same thing in Medicaid. I mean, we're, we, we really are an entitlement society, and until we get to the abyss, I don't think we're going to be able to take the steps that San Jose and San Diego took Tuesday Can night. And they were at the abyss in terms of their municipal... Only got a minute, um, minute left here. Mm -hmm. Tell me, is Romney electable in Colorado? Yes. He, he can do that. Yes, he if absolutely you, if, can if you do were that. Go, if you were to whisper in his ear and say one thing, and say, Mitt, you want to win this state? I've won it over and over again. Here's what you need to do. It would be what we discussed earlier. He is a conservative. What he needs to do is talk about issues that bring independence in in October. All right, the big the question. Big, big issues. question. Yes. Rockies have any shot this season? No, they don't have a shot to win the National League West. Maybe they could win one of those new wild cards. But they're setting in place a good team for next year. Right. I'm a big Rockies if, fan. If you had the opportunity, President of the United States, Commissioner of Baseball. Commissioner of Baseball. All right. President of the United States selling hot dogs at Rock at Coors Field. Uh, eh. That's a little more of a challenge. Bill, a good one. What, a, what a treat. Let's, let's do this more often. Hey, listen for me on Sundays on KHOW. That's K-House 630. Learn about the Independence Institute. That's independenceinstitute.org. Tell a friend, and we'll see you next week.